Good evening, everybody. I'm Jonathan Brent, editor, uh, executive director of the Evo Institute. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the lecture this evening um, on Freud, Evo, and American Jewry discourse on East, Eastern Europe as a talking cure for American Jewish ambivalence. I only wish, I hope. Uh, this is the first Max Weinreich Fellowship Lecture of this year, the Rose and Isidore Drench Memorial Fellowship and Dora and Mayer Tendler Fellowship. Uh, not only would I like to thank the Drench and Tendler families, I would like to recognize Barbara Drench, who is here with us this evening. Barbara is there. Thank you so much. Uh, for your generosity and for your family's generosity. Um, Marcus Kra, our speaker, is a PhD candidate in modern Jewish studies at Jewish Theological Seminary, JTS, in New York City, and a lecturer at Potsdam School of Jewish Theology in his native Germany. He is interested in American and European Jewish history, particularly in the cultural and intellectual engagement of Jews with, the modern, challenge, with modern challenges and opportunities for Jewish identity. His dissertation focuses on the role of the East European past in 20th century American Jewish explorations of new ways to understand their Jewishness. I would like to point out to everyone that Sigmund Freud was an honorary member of the Evo board uh, upon its founding <clears throat> in Vilna. Evo was actually conceived of, not in Vilna, but in Berlin by a group of uh, Russian Jewish emigre scholars. And so there is a strong connection to uh, our German heritage, something that Max Weinreich and many other philologists associated with Evo tried to distance the Institute from as much as they possibly could over the course of uh, its time in Vilna. Um, but it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Kra. Thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. Thank you in particular for making me a doctor already, about a year ahead of time. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be uh, the Rose and Isidore Drench Memorial Fellow, and particularly to present in the presence of Ms. Drench tonight, um, and also to be a Dora and Mayer Tendler Fellow, and to give a Max Weinreich Lecture. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody at YIVO for all their help and support in my research. It has been a great experience already. And I want to thank you all for coming out uh, and for being interested in YIVO, Freud, and American Jewry. I don't know if you came for YIVO, for Freud, or for American Jewry, or for all three, um, but I myself came to this topic through my interest in American Jewry and their identity issues in the 1940s to the 1960s. The starting point of my research is the realization that in these decades, many American Jewish thinkers and writers were positively preoccupied with the East European past. In journal articles, sermons, books, pamphlets, lectures, radio shows, and exhibitions, American Jews in this period engaged with this heritage as a few examples that I want to give you will illustrate, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of the works I'm going to um, list. <coughs> In 1943, Maurice Samuels published The World of Sholem Aleichem. Five years later, he popularized Yitzhak Leib Peretz in a similar way. In 1944, Yivo presented the first exhibition of Roman Vishniak's photographs of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, some of you may have actually seen these pictures a year ago in the replica exhibition at the International Center for Photography. In 1945, Abraham Joshua Heschel delivered in Yiddish his famed eulogy of Ashkenazic Jewry called the East European Era in Jewish History, 
which in 1950 became the best-selling book, The Earth is the Lord's. The 1950s saw Martin Buber's writings on Hasidism, as well as the publication of the popular anthropological study, Life is with People, the Jewish little town of Eastern Europe. In 1954, many American Jews became acquainted with Yiddish stories through an anthology edited by Irving Howe and Eliezer Greenberg called A Treasury of Yiddish Stories. In 1959, Philip Roth published his story, Eli the Fanatic, which um, illuminates American Jewish ambivalence vis-a-vis -vis East European survivor immigrants. A year later, Abraham Kahan's The Rise of David Levinsky was reissued, all the while Isaac Bashevis Singer presented a very different imagery of East European life. And finally, at least for the period that I'm interested in, in 1964, Fiddler on the Roof became a smash success on Broadway. All these highly diverse yet related cultural products form the larger discourse that I analyze. In the 25 year period that I focus on, 1940 to 65, American Jews encountered and created a bewildering range of images of the East European past. They engaged with Hasidism as well as with socialist revolutionaries. They romanticized the shtetl as the locus of warm, pious Yiddishkeit or wrote it off as the embodiment of poverty and parochialism permanently threatened by pogroms. We see American Jews trying to make sense of and find sense in their East European heritage in all these cultural products. I believe that the competition of images and narratives that we see in these books and articles and other publications I believe that this competition was due not just to the complexities of East European Jewish life, but also to the complexities of the American Jewish present. And by analyzing how American Jews in this period understood and presented the East European past, we can learn new things about their present American Jewish concerns. In this context, YIVO was, of course, one of the most important actors. As you know, YIVO relocated its headquarters from Vilna to New York in 1940 and immediately engaged with issues of American Jewish identity. It saw its mission as preserving the East European heritage and making a broad sense of Jewishness or Yiddishkeit rooted in a Yiddish-based communal culture relevant for American Jews. This way, YIVO became a very important voice in this discourse. But I want to argue that YIVO was much more than just one voice. YIVO, and Max Weinreich in particular, added a concept to the discourse that highlights a deeper meaning of the American Jewish preoccupation with their East European history. I will argue that by talking constantly about this past, by probing it, retelling it, reconstructing it, and deconstructing it, American Jews looked for meaning in their Jewishness that they didn't find anywhere else. They tried to find meaning in the East European past in order to fulfill their American Jewish present. And this is where Freud comes in via Max Weinreich. Weinreich knew Freud's work. He had translated it into Yiddish. And Weinreich analyzed the state of American Jewry in Freudian psychological terms, in the sense that engaging with the East European heritage should have a therapeutic effect. His Freudian argument was that American Jews needed first to become conscious of their current situation, which he found problematic, before they could improve it by reflecting on it and becoming self-conscious. To me, Reflexivity and self-consciousness are key terms for understanding American Jewry in this period. And in this way, I believe that Weinreich supplied terms and categories to understand American Jewry's exploration of the past and to understand Yibo's voice in this discourse. And this is what I will try to illuminate in my presentation. Let me pause at this point for a necessary caveat. Analyzing the state of American Jewry in terms of psychoanalysis and therapy, therapy and talking cure could easily lead to the impression that American Jewry at that time was psychologically sick. 
I don't believe that Max Weinreich thought this way, and I certainly do not think so myself. Weinreich had a positive vision of American Jewry and its potential, and I don't want to misrepresent his thoughts or my own approach by pathologizing American Jewry in the post-war period. This brings us to the heart of the matter. What was the state of American Jewry in, say, 1950, 10 years after YIVO arrived here in New York? Here, YIVO's view differs quite starkly from what was, at least in retrospect, a dominant perspective, both in popular views of the time and in scholarly works. This popular and influential narrative is often expressed in Arthur Gorin's phrase of the golden decade for American Jewry, 1945 to 55. Other historians have extended this golden era even into the 1960s. According to this optimistic perspective, American Jews at that time enjoyed a broad communal consensus based on the common identification of Jewishness as a religious category. The supposed congruence of Jewishness and Judaism made for a stable communal identity, according to this narrative. The suburban synagogue was the embodiment of the consensus to organize Jewishness around religion, and the suburban synagogue was also the symbol that American Jews had been accepted into the mainstream of American society. With anti-Semitism discredited and in decline, a house in suburbia, the kids getting into good colleges, the dream of a Jewish state come true in the Middle East, what's not to be happy about, right? More than this optimistic picture would suggest, it turns out. Recently, scholars have increasingly questioned the golden era narrative and restored a sense of ambivalence in how American Jews felt about their new circumstances and, as a matter of fact, about their very Jewishness itself. I emphasize scholars restored the sense of ambivalence because if you read what American Jews themselves wrote about their situation in the 1940s and 60s, it is hard to escape the notion that alongside the overt optimism, there was a strong sense of unease, of crisis even. Of course, some aspects of this sense of crisis affected all Americans in that period, the Cold War, the Atomic Age, the impact of mass society, domestic anti-communism, deteriorating race relations, but there were also important developments that were highly specific to American Jewry and its particular sense of crisis. And much of this had to do, of course, with the Holocaust. The shock of the annihilation of European Jewry affected American Jews in multiple ways. On the personal level, it was the death of people who may have been relatives and the destruction of places that were part of family history or mythology. On a more abstract level, American Jews realized that they were now cut off from the sources that had nourished Jewish life and culture and spirituality for centuries, including American Jewish life. With the centers of Jewish learning in Eastern Europe destroyed, who would preserve the precious heritage that had informed American Judaism through the influx of immigrants, through intellectual networks, through political and religious movements, and through the memory that had been transmitted through the generations. American Jews realized that they were now the largest and most powerful and resourceful Jewish community in the world, and that the responsibility to guard Jewish interests and Jewish heritage fell to them. Many of their leaders, especially the religious leaders, harbored strong doubts that American Jewry was ready and able and willing to shoulder this new responsibility. A community in the middle of integrating economically and socially into American society, just beginning to look beyond the material concerns of poor immigrants, did not possess the level of knowledge, commitment, and focus to take on this role particularly as it was also integrating culturally, that is, embracing a culture not immediately conducive to traditional Jewish learning and ways of life. Therefore, the concerns of many American Jewish leaders focused on the degree and nature of Jewish commitment, especially of the second generation. Countless articles were that the children of immigrants were so eager to be accepted by their new neighbors in the suburbs that they limited their Jewishness to synagogue membership or enrolling their kids in Hebrew school. 
Religious observance was rather low, and so was the level of Jewish learning. Yes, synagogue construction and enrollment reached record levels in the post-war decades, but at least in retrospect, this seems to have had less to do with renewed religious commitment, but reflected mostly social expectations that Jewishness be expressed in the category of religion rather than in categories of ethnicity. Judaism came to be recognized as part of the Judeo-Christian heritage and as one of the three foundational religions of America. Protestant Catholic Jew was the iconic title of a book by Will Herberg that captured this development in 1955. The flip side of this development was that other ways than religion to express Jewishness, particularly ethnic ones, were disfavored socially. Being different in other ways than religion was not something that American Jews could expect to be welcomed. Many struggled to get rid of the Yiddish accents, changed names that sounded too Jewish, did not make a fuss about non-kosher food in workplaces. Jewishness was expressed as and reduced to Judaism. And while Judaism had come to be respected, Jewishness retained some of its stigma. As a result, many contemporary observers were that American Jews had not developed a strong, self-confident, and positive Jewish identity, but were rather insecure and uncertain in themselves. American Jews didn't know how to square broader social expectations with their own desires. They didn't know how to balance their urge to finally be Americans, like their neighbors, and the urge to retain some sense of meaningful difference or distinctiveness. And very often, this assessment was expressed in the language of psychology. A few examples. Max Weinreich said in 1948, quote, only part of the Jewish community share in the joys that being a Jew can offer whereas all Jews share in the disabilities of being a Jew. This makes for very strong personality problems." End of quote. In a graduation speech at Baltimore Hebrew College, he warned, quote, in order to keep his personality intact and vigorous, the Jewish individual needs acceptable and sufficiently flexible psychic defenses. These defenses cannot be provided in the present state of atomization of Jewish life in this country. A healthy individual life evidently presupposes a healthy group life. Hasn't American social psychology taught us that culture and personality are but different aspects of one whole? End of quote. So there was much talking about Jews with divided selves, Jews who suppressed their Jewishness in their encounters with non-Jews, and were therefore not well adjusted psychologically and socially. All this was very ostentatiously expressed in a popular novel that was published in 1946, and I'm not sure how many of you may have even heard of that, Wasteland by Joe Sinclair. It relates how its young protagonist, John Brown, nay Jacob Brownowitz, with the help of a psychiatrist, manages to understand and overcome his self-hatred, solitude, alienation from his family, and his alcoholism. Uh, he understands that he's projecting all his fears onto his Jewishness and the despised immigrant culture of his parents. Early on in his therapy, the psychiatrist innocently asks him, quote, you must be very proud of being a Jew. And the novel goes on. For a moment, John felt stunned, as if the words had crashed into his chest like a bar of iron. Then he cried sharply, that's wrong, that's all wrong, I hate being a Jew. Nobody in the office even knows I'm a Jew. My God, I used to wake up sweating because I dreamed they found out I was. He broke off, suddenly aware that he had said it. After all the years, he finally had said it out loud. At another of the therapeutic sessions, the doctor asks him, are you very mixed up about being a Jew? And John answers, I feel very bad about it. The way I hate it, and still at the same time, it's like, like candles burning all the time. I'm all mixed up about it. Sure, I just never know what to do. The psychiatrist notes, 
subjects feels deep shame arising from Jewishness. Apparently, however, religion in itself means nothing to him. He's very confused. This is especially true of the Jewish question. The Friday night, which he stresses so much, seems a matter of identification. One of his very few possessions of security, stability. The matter of Jewishness seems to be tied with identification. Watch. John eventually learns to embrace his Jewishness, expressing this, of course, by his participation in the family Seder, where he finally experiences his Jewishness as something beautiful and meaningful. And it is no coincidence that he finds this beauty and meaning in a religious ceremony and not in any other expression of Jewishness. Quote from the novel. He was part of the table belonging in this chair. He was not demanding of his father and brother, not ashamed of his sister, not guilty before his mother. He was part of the prayer and part of the evening. And soon, at the proper moment, he would take his place in carrying on the service for another year. All over the world, wherever Jews were gathered for this holiday, the youngest son present was ready to speak. He listened to his father's voice praying, the wailing deep tones thrilled him as they rose and waned to a whisper, rose again like walls. Inside of him, a quiet, tremulous voice said, Oh God. Then his father said, Well, Jake, Jake now, ask the questions. He stood up, began reading to them with all his heart, Wherefore is this night distinguished from all other nights? These are the very last lines of the novel. It's not world literature, but it neatly illustrates the belief at the time that psychology would be able to diagnose the crises from which many American Jews as individuals and American Jewry as a whole were suffering, and that psychology had ways to heal them by restoring a sense of Jewish wholeness and identity. To Max Weinreich, the situation of American Jewry seemed like a more radical version of the constellation that led to the founding of YIVO in 1925. He saw structural parallels between pre-war East European and post-war American Jewry in that both communities were shaken up by the forces of rapid modernization and as a result were spiritually unmoored due to the loss of the framework of the traditional way of life. Weinreich saw American Jewry as even more unstable because of the rupture of immigration and the radical modernity and openness of American society that led many, particularly young Jews, to question the relevance of the heritage. This lack of positive identification with Jewishness was the key diagnosis for the individual this meant an unhealthy emotional state for American Jews as a group, communal and cultural survival was at stake. Weinreich had studied such questions as a fellow at Yale in 1932 and 33 in a seminar that dealt with the relationships among individual, family and larger social units and with questions of acculturation. Using this approach, he later shaped Yivo's research agenda shifting its focus from merely preserving the Jewish cultural heritage to making it relevant for current problems. This approach was expressed in how YIVO presented itself in 1945 at its annual conference. Quote, the YIVO seeks to aid American Jewry in understanding the Jewish situation and in utilizing it to the advantage of the group and of the nation as a whole. YIVO at that time believed it had to offer the two key ingredients of a solution. Social science as a tool to understand the meaning of a positive Jewish identity and the East European heritage as the content of such a positive sense of Jewishness. Ivo's mission, mission statement of 1943 said, Ivo's work is a means of giving the Jew the opportunity to acquire self-knowledge and of providing him with new implements in the intellectual struggle for survival. Two years later, the report on its research activities stated, quote, without research and study of our life of yesterday and today, the Jewish community cannot adequately plan for tomorrow. 
The YIBO is engaged in social, social research not only to accumulate knowledge for future scholars, but to aid practically in making Jewish life richer and more significant for the individual Jew and to help it outlining schemes of development for the Jewish group. Preserving the memory of East European Jewish life would be essential to this task by providing its content. Another YIVO activist, Israel Breslov, in a speech quoted the historian Shimon Dubnov saying, a man who has lost his memory ceases to be an individual. A people that has lost its yesterday has no tomorrow. Breslov went on to say, ever since its establishment in Vilna, the YIVO has been the memory of the Jewish people. The YIVO has preserved our yesterday, helping thereby in the shaping of our tomorrow. And this is what YIVO did. It reconstructed the East European past to make it usable for the American present. But I want to argue that it was not just YIVO, but the entire discourse in magazines, from pulpits on the radio, at union meetings, in schools and museums. This was a collective attempt by organized American Jewry to do the same, to make sense of the East European past for the sake of the American Jewish present. From this perspective, I believe that YIVO provided the diagnosis, the need to come to terms with one's own history, and suggested a therapy increased consciousness, reflecting about the past and its meaning, talking about it, and in this sense, we can say that YIVO prescribed a talking cure or coping strategy for American Jewry. But, an important but, YIVO was not the only therapist administering this process. The many journals and books and exhibitions and rabbis engaging the East European past meant that American Jews heard many different voices about it. At the time, at least, YIVO aspired to be not just one, but the dominant voice analyzing and helping American Jewry by talking about the East European past. YIVO claimed to be uniquely positioned for that responsibility. Weinreich said in 1944 in a speech entitled The Place of the YIVO in Jewish Life, quote, up to the time of the YIVO, there was no one who could look at Jewish life in America from the inside to see its local specificness and at the same time its roots in Jewish tradition. We do not overlook any group of the five million Jews in America, not even the Jew who is afraid that a large Jewish meeting conducted in Yiddish may increase anti-Jewish feelings. Even such a Jew can we help lighten the burden of his Jewish problems." End of quote. And in this period, YIVO was recognized for its claim to this role in American Jewish life. Isaac Schwarzbord, a Zionist leader with the World Jewish Congress, said in 1958, the YIVO, with its cultural treasures and the integration of various elements into an organic, holistic Jewishness, can provide this role. Nath, <coughs> excuse me. Um, a few years before, uh, Schwarzbart said that in a very symbolic act, the committee organizing the 1954 celebrations of the tercentenary of Jewish life in North America had turned over all its documents, not to the American Jewish Committee or any other organization, but to the YIVO. And YIVO used this recognition to confidently raise its voice to advocate its specific solution to the crisis of mid-century mid American Jewry. It pointed to the broad, folk-based culture of East European Jewry, arguing that this alone could provide contemporary Jewishness with positive meaning. This sense of Yiddishkeit would transcend the American reduction of Jewishness to religion or Judaism. Yiddishkeit would be found in the daily social life of the group and in the affirmation of its cultural heritage. Such a culture would constitute Jews as a distinct ethnic group with a meaningful history that would point to a meaningful future. Identification with the group and its heritage would be the basis for a stable identity. This model would make for Jewish unity and continuity across time and space, thanks to the essence of Jewishness found in Yiddishkeit. In the description of this solution, we see again the language of psychology. 
where the diagnosis was fragmentation, divide, divided selves, and suppression of Jewishness, the solution lay in unity, continuity, and in the integration of various elements into one organic holistic Jewishness. In 1965, Nathan Reich, head of YIVO's research division, pointed out the major differences in the milieus in which Jewishness functioned in Eastern Europe and in America. There, in Eastern Europe, Jews and Jewishness formed an integral. This is not the case in America, and here the YIVO has a special function to fulfill to integrate Jews and Jewishness. And at the annual conference in 1964, another scholar, Mervyn Fox, stated, for the young Jewish man and woman to find their Jewish identity, there must exist an integral Jewish culture. Jew Yivo set out, the, set out to emphasize the unity and continuities of Jewishness across time and space and across the many ruptures of modernization. It postulated Yiddishkeit as an essence that could be applied under circumstances as different as post-war America and the State of Israel. This essence was also sufficiently general to allow for intra-Jewish pluralism, as the essence informed various expressions of authentic Jewishness. The first post-war YIVO conference declared in 1946, quote, we believe that in this post-war world, it is possible to transplant and foster, wheresoever Jews live, the creativity of Eastern European Jewry, which revealed itself in traditional Judaism, in Yiddish and in Hebrew literature, in the struggles of the people for their cultural, political, and economic emancipation, in the upbuilding of Palestine and of the settlements overseas. Again, Yivo claims to be unique in this recognition of continuities despite the changes. Weinreich said in 1945, quote, up to the time of the Yivo, Jewish scholarship did not, did not take cognizance of this organic unity. The bearers of tradition did not want to see the continuity in the change, end of quote. This approach to mediate between the East European past and the American present, to build bridges across the chasms for the sake of meaningful unity, can be illustrated by the contest for immigrant autobiographies that YIVO sponsored in America in 1942. It asked respondents to answer the question, why I left the old country and what I have achieved in America. Thereby, it encouraged the participants to create narratives that integrated their pre-immigration lives in Eastern Europe with their experience in America into a positive, meaningful whole. It allowed participants to construct an identity in the literal sense of sameness or of an essence that connected their pre- and post-immigration lives into one whole, a talking cure in written form. This notion of an essence that YIVO found in East European Jewishness and would make relevant for American Jewry also meant that YIVO was not playing off the past against the present. Committed to social science, YIVO scholars were not prone to romanticizing the East European Jewish experience. Weinreich said in 1941, quote, traditional Jewish life was fuller of problems than we think through our rose-tinted glasses, end of quote. In the 1940s, he prepared a report for the American Jewish Committee on pre-war Jewish life in Eastern Europe, and it included sections not just on religious life and the Jewish family, but also on criminality. And in his report on Jewish life in Latvia, the first alphabetical entry was alcoholism. Such unsentimental realism put Yivo scholars in conflict with a significant part of their audience immigrants who turned to YIVO to preserve their idealized memories of the old country. YIVO was aware of its role as a symbol of this past, but it tried to fend off the nostalgic approaches in order to protect its scientific integrity. This scientific openness was also what kept YIVO from making the East European model the measure of American Jewish authenticity. For all the critical assessments of American Jewry, Many of its scholars, Weinreich included, believed in the potential of American Jewry. And for all the idealization that was involved in crystallizing an essence of Jewishness, they recognized 
that the radically different circumstances in America meant that Jewishness here would look very different than what it had looked like in Eastern Europe. Nathan Reich, again, the head of HIVO's research division, warned that, quote, we are inclined to gauge the American Jewish community with the standards and criteria of Eastern Europe. Historically, this is a false approach. Just as Jewish Babylonia differs from Judea, Spain from Babylonia, Mainz from Cordoba and Krakow from Frankfurt, so New York, Chicago and Los Angeles differ from Warsaw, Vilna and Lodz. The Jewish community in America is in the process of evolving its own specific physiognomy, which will be American Jewish. And the 1944 annual YIVO conference declared, quote, we have full faith in the ability of East European Jewish spirituality to create a new synthesis of Jewishness, end of quote. Predicated on this belief in the potential of American Jewry, YIVO participated in the broad discourse on the East European past and used its strong voice to advocate its own vision of such a new synthesis. It would take more than another lecture to address the question how successful YIVO has been within this discourse. As mentioned, it had a lot of competition and at least at mid 20th century, its vision of a Yiddish based autonomous ethnic culture was not very much in sync with its zeitgeist. The number of Yiddish speakers was in decline and the notion of ethnic pluralism had gone dormant and would reemerge only in the 1970s. The American Grund is a Steinediger. The American soil is stony, Weinreich remarked as early as 1941. But committed to its ideals, YIVO did not stop plowing this stony soil, trying to make it fertile for its Yiddishist ideology so that the seed or the essence of East European Yiddishkeit could strike root, roots in this country. I argue that between 1940 and 65, the American Jewish conversation about the East European past was particularly broad and open. This was because American Jews found themselves in radically new circumstances and looked to the past for guidance. The range of narratives, images, aesthetics, and lessons that were drawn from Eastern Europe was uniquely wide. However, in my analysis, the parameters of this discourse began to contract in the mid 1960s. The success of Fiddler in 1964 is a symbol of this change. Through Tevye, the looks of the East European Jew, the way he speaks and sings and dances, his opinion, his attitudes to religion and God, became more fixed than before. And so did the general perspective of American Jews on this past. Much of the success of the musical can be explained by the different perspective of a new generation of American Jews on their heritage, as they related with nostalgia to a world they had not experienced themselves but reconstructed anew to make it usable for their own needs and interests. A new round in the discourse began. To conclude, YIVO has, from its arrival in America 74 years ago, aspired to be a mediator between Yiddish-speaking immigrants and English-speaking Jews, between past and present, between Eastern Europe and America in a larger sense. This meant mediating and negotiating powerful inner tensions by means of psychological approaches. So let me come back to Freud and American Jewry one more time. I argue that YIVO had its diagnosis correct. American Jews at mid-century were ambivalent about their Jewishness as a source of meaningful identity. Yivo's therapy was based in Yiddish, a Yiddish-based folk culture as the grounding of such a meaningful identity. Whether this therapy was adequate or not, or whether it was even properly tried by the patient, the diagnosis was powerful. As expressed in Freudian terms by Weinreich in a conversation with Dan Miron, YIVO was committed to understanding American Jewry's deepest desires for an integral Jewishness. Quote, if American Jews still dream as a group, Yiddish is the language they speak in their dream. It is still the idiom of their collective unconscious. For their personality to become whole, they, or at least some of them, will have to go back to Yiddish one day. 
Otherwise, their enormous creative force will be blocked by an inner psychic fragmentation. Somebody will have to spell out for them the contents of their dream to elucidate the vision they saw with bleary eyes." End of quote. And this is what Yivo has aspired to do. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to t take some questions now. Um, in 1962, I taught Italian at Temple University. Many of the students were of Italian background. I discovered every single one of them could name the towns their parents had come from and could point to them on a map. Uh, among Jews, this was extremely rare. And people would say things like, my parents came from a town on the border between Romania and white Russia, or something impossible like that, or would get the country wrong, not simply because the boundaries changed. And then, as time went on, and Yiddish was a source of embarrassment, and people would say, uh, Yiddish has no grammar. And by the time of Fiddler on the Roof, there weren't that many old native speakers anymore. It was no longer a threat. And so it was all right to come out of the closet and to love Yiddish. And uh, the source of embarrassment nowadays has shifted to Israel. <laughs> um, I, I think this is very, um, very illustrative of some of the points I also think I found in my research. I would assume that many of the Jewish students you mentioned also had problems locating the places their parent or their grandparents came from, mostly because those places had been destroyed. Um, and during the Cold War, uh, it was much more difficult if you felt such an inclination to explore your heritage and roots it was much more difficult to go to Poland or Ukraine or the Soviet Union than to go to Italy in many ways, political and practical. So um, I think there are many factors that go into, into that equation. Um, I hesitate a bit to touch the issue of Israel, but um, I have a little bit of a hypothesis that part of the American Jewish infatuation with the East European past that came about in the 60s and in the 70s, maybe even earlier, also had to do that this was a homeland that was safely in the past and that did not make any political or financial demands on you. Um, yeah, I leave it at that, but thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could um, say a little more about how you see Weinreich's analysis of the, you know, the, the real source of this psychic, you know, kind of problem, right? Because in the 30s, Weinreich was applying these, these Freudian ideas, right, primarily to the problem of anti-Semitism, right, that he saw the, the main problem facing young Jews in Poland was that they couldn't develop a positive self-image because of the anti-Semitism of the surrounding society, right? In the United States, it's kind of the flip side of that, which is assimilation, right? American Jews are assimilating, and so they're losing touch with their roots and with their Jewish identity, right? So now if you, you know, you mentioned Dubna, that quote from Dubna, right? If you go back to the Dubnovian sort of tradition of nationalism, right, it's more, it's more Jungian than Freudian, right? It's the idea that, every person has this inherent national identity, so a true assimilation isn't possible, right? Because you're, you won't be true to your, you know, your, your inner self if you try to assimilate into another national group. But if you take this in a kind of Freudian terms, right, it becomes less part, it's not about a group identity, it's more about individual identity and creating an individual wholeness, right, on the individual level. So, you know, for Weinreich, you know, you know, what I'm wondering is, do you think he's still kind of hedging his bets in a way and, you know, going back to that, to that earlier model that, you know, 
the sort of national identity is something that's inherent so that that kind of that trumps the kind of individual you know the kind of the group identity trumps the individual identity in that Jungian sense or is it and does he really believe that true assimilation you know if, if let's say an American Jew could assimilate if they were American Jews were completely accepted would there still be a reason for ambivalence right or is or is is the root cause still anti-Semitism? In other words, there is still anti-Semitism in American society. That's why Jews can't assimilate completely, and that's why they have this fractured identity and this ambivalence. I hope that's clear. Um, I have to say, first of all, what I forgot to say in the beginning, uh, the disclaimer that I'm not a psychologist, and I was so afraid that somebody would put me on the spot by bringing up Jung and go into go more deeply into Freud than I can actually follow. So I, I'm not able to speak to the Freudian versus Jungian differences in approach. Um, and I probably have a very imperfect and fragmentary answer to your larger questions from what I know about Weinreich's engagement with psychology, social psychology, and was also sociology and anthropology, at least what he did at Yale, was that it was precisely at the nexus of how the individual and the group and culture interact and inform each other. Um, I think one of the, the quotes I used in the talk was his emphasis that um, individual identity is predicated on feeling part of identifying with a group. Um, to him, the group was the crucial intermediate between the individual, the family on the one hand as the small units, and the nation or the so larger society as a whole. So um, I think he placed great emphasis and attributed great meaning to group identity um, as to whether he believed in an inherent um, Jewish group or national identity. I'm not sure, but I would not think so because that would, in the end, contravene all his um, scholarly openness and his, his openness to scientific methods of research. Um, but I have to admit that's all, all I can say to that, that otherwise that goes beyond what I can say about Weinreich and I don't want to fudge that and make things up, particularly not in a Weinreich lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, you didn't mention anything about intermarriage, and I wondered whether um, you considered the uh, evidence of intermarriage or, and the effect of intermarriage during that pe period of time and the incidence of intermarriage. Um, I haven't spoken about it because from the research I've been doing, it does not come up all that often in the period that I'm talking about, that is up to the mid-60s. Here and there, there are first cries of alarm, but um, particularly compared to the level of intermarriage, the numbers of intermarriage we are confronting today, it was a very low level concern. If we talk about 50% plus today, it was a fraction of that in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s. It came up as a specter, and because nobody could know in advance that it would go up to 50% or even higher um, 40, 50 years after, to the people who raised the alarm, it already felt like a threat and a problem. Um, but these were, this was not a mass-based discussion at that point in time, which is why I did not uh, place any emphasis on that in this talk. Let me come to the topic of your essay, and maybe I missed it. It is entirely possible. I didn't pick up the connection between talking cure and the Jewish ambivalence. What I picked up of what you say is the introspection of Freud and the need to identify the problem before one could do. But point out, focus on what talking cure has to do with Jewish ambivalence. 
The other thing is, I am not a psychologist, I'm a sociologist, but except for Moses and uh, atheism and monotheism that Freud wrote after his father's death, when I read Freud, I wouldn't know he's Jewish. Um, I'll start with your, with your first question. Maybe, that's, maybe it's a little forced to, and maybe Freud would spin in his grave if he had heard this, um, this lecture tonight, but um, I think it's at least an interesting metaphor or analogy to say that um, Yivo and Weinreich suggested that um, ambivalence could be healed and cured by talking about it, talking about the issues that cause the ambivalence, uh, that cause the inner tensions, bringing them out, bringing them to the fore, making the, bringing them from the subconscious into the conscious realm, and thereby allow them to, to become manageable, to unblock whatever energies were blocked up because of the ambivalence and the suppression of dreams, desires, urges. Um, and at the collective level, um, my reading of this entire discourse, this preoccupation of American Jews, of many American Jews with the East European past, was one way to come to terms with this past, which had, after the war and the Holocaust, taken on a whole new meaning for them, uh, and which directly impacted on how they presented themselves to their fellow Americans. So. Um, maybe if I limit it to an analogy or a metaphor, I still think it can be um, an, a helpful explanatory tool to make sense of why American Jews were so occupied with the East European past. As to reading Freud and finding out that he's, whether he's Jewish or not, um, I don't know if it's possible to read Freud innocently and pretend that we don't know that he was Jewish, but there's... Well, again, I'm, I'm not a psychologist and not even a, a, an historian of psychology, but by now I think um, people who are specialized in this field have um, pointed out so many points of contact between Freud in his biography, in his intellectual life, in his personal life with his Jewish heritage and in his, his entire biography. Jonathan Brent mentioned his uh, membership as uh, an honorary member on the Yivo board. So, um, I, I can't say really much of that, and I hope that by limiting what I said to an analogy, uh, we don't have to ascertain Freud's Jewishness by reading his works in order to make him usable for, for what I try to say about American Jewish issues. First of all, thank you very much for coming from Germany to speak as we very seldom hear something here. Here we hear mostly clarification, how happy we are, how healthy we are. That's life typically how it presented in America. And I believe don't be so humble about your knowledge in psychology because you are from Germany where candidate to PhD, much more serious than advanced doctorate in psychology here, where that's business, not a science. And uh, now my kind of question. In this country, officially by national statistics, 25% of population older than 18 have clinically proven diagnosis, psychological, psychiatrical. Actually more because many never saw psychologist or psychiatr. And it would be very interesting to compare Orthodox and Hasidim with Reformed Jews. My assumption, of course, is that Reformed Jews, even not necessary on level of caricature by Woody Allen and Philip Ross, would be much less healthy in comparison with Orthodox. Not 100% sure. Maybe, again, you don't need to be a psychologist, just to read literature. 
did you find, I never found comparison like this about their psychological health in comparison. I, I agree with you that it would be very interesting if one could find such comparisons and statistics, but I have to say I haven't, I haven't found them yet. But if I find them, I would love to turn them into another talk, and uh, I'm sure it would be probably more interesting than, than what I had to say today. My question relates to um, an observation that you made that there was a, not, if not a chasm, a conflict between immigrants who turned to YIVO uh, looking for a specific sort of meaning, if not nostalgia, and the social scientific mission of YIVO. Uh, so my question is, in the period that you deal with, what made the uh, immigrants, or maybe perhaps it was a certain type of immigrant, uh, turn to a social scientific organization uh, for meaning? Was it the uh, waning of the traditional Landsmannschaften? Was it uh, the sense that by the, especially by the 50s and 60s, there were fewer Yiddish speakers? Or did it become something that seemed to ensure a future uh, for their culture uh, in, in distinction to other or organized forms of life that were perhaps waning? Thank you. I, I would say that probably both factors that you mentioned yourself played an important role in why um, a specific segment, a large segment of immigrants um, turned to YIVO for identity purposes or for... Um, I would... Let, let me add another reason because I think they didn't turn to YIVO only for identity purposes in the conscious sense of trying to make sense of, in the sense of thinking about that or attending a lecture that would help them make sense of that. I think a large number of them turned to YIVO because YIVO in a, in a social sense became the organizing focus of an entire Yiddish speaking immigrant community. Maybe in a way that the, the Yiddish formats did as a publication maybe in the way that Second Avenue Yiddish Theater um, did in, in the cultural sense where it was still flourishing. Um, and YIVO um, outlived the Yiddish Theater in that sense um, and it provided a, a venue in the physical space where you could share time and talk about um, issues you shared an interest in with, with fellow immigrants. So I believe some of YIVO's attraction lay in its social function um, but also, and Weinreich um, somewhere says that very openly, he acknowledges that yes, YIVO has become a myth and he acknowledges that YIVO to some degree lives off that status as a myth because this is what brings in people. Some people, you know, it's the old joke um, of why people attend shul. Is it to talk to God or is it to talk to Cohen? I would assume that um, that a number of people come to YIVO, um, today's audience excluded not to hear a lecture, but to meet people who are also interested in, in the larger topics. So I would, I would argue that there is um, a constellation of factors that, um, that taken together made for YIVO's appeal at that period. But it was, I would think, in few cases, the pure intellectual interest without um, any social urge or need to, to spend time on such topics with fellow immigrants. Is this on? Yes. Um, can you tell us please or share the, sub, the thesis of your thesis as it's developed to this point, and perhaps tell us a little bit about how it's progressing and where you think it's going to end. Thank you. I'm happy to do because that's a great rehearsal for meeting my dissertation advisor tomorrow. So, <laughs> um, um, I, I said part of what's my thesis um, in the talk already. I'm trying, to I'm trying to read back 
a conversation American Jews had about the East European past to their American Jewish present. Find out why, for example, a reform religious publication portrays Hasidism in a very specific way that is very different from how an orthodox journal does it, which again is very different from a secular intellectual journal such as Partisan Review um, looks at Hasidism. All of them engage with Hasidism, but they present very different images or lessons of Hasidism. Um, and in this case, I think one can read them back into different visions or ideals. Um, these different voices publications had for American Jewishness. I think this was a period of profound cultural transformation when American Jews in this span of one generation, 1940 to, 60, to 65, um, looked for a new paradigm of Jewishness. The traditional religious paradigm no longer held sway for many of them. Uh, at the same time, the um, the reduction of Jewishness to Judaism that we saw in the 1950s felt incomplete and not meaningful enough for a large segment of American Jewry at the time, as far as we can, we can tell in retrospect. So there was a need to reconstruct Jewishness in ways that would be authentic, um, meaningful, in line with the modern sensitivities of post-war America, but will also be connected to the Jewish past, uh, draw some authenticity, legitimacy, and some cachet from the Jewish past. And I believe that this was a crucial period in which different players um, tried to fulfill these needs in different ways. Um, this is what I mean by a particularly open discourse over the span of a generation until 65, until for many different reasons, the return of ethnic pluralism, um, the Six-Day War, which um, brought Israel into American Jewish imagination in a whole new different way, until in that period, in the late 60s and early 70s, um, there was yet another round to construct Jewishness, and Eastern Europe, as um, a reference point, took on yet a, no a new um, role. So, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> We're going to take a few last questions. Did you have? I guess I have a question about the whole concept of ambivalence. Um, you know, it interested me. The, gen the first gentleman who asked a question he was talking about his Italian students. Um, you know, when a third generation Italian can't speak fluent Italian, I've never heard anybody say, oh, he's ambivalent about his Italian heritage. He can't speak Italian. His father didn't speak Italian. He didn't speak Italian. Somebody in my generation, I'm first generation American. If we don't speak Yiddish, it means we rejected it. Uh, maybe we didn't learn it. Maybe we didn't make a decision. Not By the same token, when you're talking, it sounds like I'm giving a lecture too. There is a question here, I promise. It says, when you're talking about ambivalence, is it not, you know, I'm thinking of the long quote from The Wasteland where all of the things that the protagonist decided he didn't want to do, the psychiatrist decided this was deep-rooted shame, ambivalence. You know, I'm not kosher. It's not because I'm ashamed to be kosher. It's because I've decided God, God doesn't care what I eat. Does that mean I'm ambivalent? I, mean, I guess my whole question is why do we assume that decisions that Jews make either in 1950 or in 2014 that they make about which parts of Judaism mean something to them and which parts don't are necessarily Freudian questions or a sign of ambivalence or a sign of anything other than a choice. Mm. That's a good question and a tough question. Um, to, to remain within the overall scheme of what I try to lay out, I would I would venture to say that in the period I'm talking about, I would assume that many of the American Jews we, we encountered or I encountered in these publications did not make those decisions very consciously. In line with what I uh, put out as a hypothesis, that this is a period in which American Jews become more self-conscious, reflexive, reflecting on 
in what way am I Jewish? What does that mean? How do I express that? Is it enough for me to express it by enrolling in a synagogue or do I want to express that in different ways by keeping kosher, by keeping Shabbat, by reading a Jewish newspaper, by attending a Jewish film festival of which there weren't that many at the time. But um, I would counter your argument or your question by saying maybe this was a time when this process of becoming conscious and making conscious decisions was in the middle of, was on the way, but had not yet led to our um, status of being very reflective and much more self-confident today about the decisions you were talking about. Um, that would be one, one answer I have. The other is that um, we can find the ambivalence in many ways. There are many more supporting facts uh, and illustrations of this whole notion of ambivalence. Um, there was a, um, actually a quantitative study which was done in the 1950s by, um, it's called Jewishness on the Suburban Frontier. Um, and was conducted in a Jewish suburban community um, in Hyde Park, Illinois in the 1950s. And what, one of the most interesting facts to me is that for all suburban Jewish Americans overt desire to integrate, to be as American as possible, to feel as American as possible, they all revealed that their friendship circles, if we're talking about close friends, they were 95% Jewish. Um, which supports, in my reading, the fact that many of them probably joined synagogue rather to talk to the Rosenblatts uh, and to the Cohens, and not so much out of a particular spiritual desire. But this is something that they probably didn't acknowledge in the office. And from the autobiographical testimonies we have of the time, we can, we can read that, that ambivalence, that many of them did not feel fully at ease among Gentiles. Some of them said so in this particular, um, in this study, which was by, by Marshall Sclair and Joseph Greenblum, now the name uh, comes back to me. Um, they said so. There was a, a greater level of, a greater comfort level when being surrounded by Jews, which is why they kept mostly Jewish friendship circles, but they would probably never have acknowledged that in public, um, in, in a public situation. And that to me is a strong indicator of ambivalence in everyday life. So I think one can make a strong case for ambivalence. It sounds to me from what you're describing, they weren't ambivalent, they just decided I'm better off not making a big deal of this to my boss. I know how I feel, not me. No, they're saying, what they're saying to themselves, I know how I feel, I know I prefer hanging out with the rose and black to the rose and Jesus. I'm not ambivalent about it at all, this is what I want to do, but I think for practical reasons, I won't discuss it in the workplace. I don't see that as a difference. I see that as a practical decision of how to live comfortably in a society that was not necessarily religion-wise. But where's the ambivalence? I think the ambivalence is that many of them probably would not have described their lives as living comfortable in terms of their inner lives. Plus, I don't think there were many, were many Rodriguez's in the suburbs at that point. <laughs> Smith hyphen Jones. Okay. okay, all right, okay. Okay, one last question. We have time for one last question. Um, I'm going to depart a little bit from the topic exactly of this, but I'm going to bring you back... Uh, to, the, to your native Germany. Uh, about 15 years ago, um, they, Daniel Goldhagen uh, wrote uh, the famous book, uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners, in which uh, he accused the, the entire German, uh, almost the entire German nation of the, of the craze, uh, of the his mass hysteria of uh, anti-Semitism. Um, Nowadays, Germany looks at least at the surface of uh, changing uh, the face. Uh, Angela Merkel uh, uh, turns, turns things around and in the middle of the biggest uh, anti-Semitism in the world uh, in, since World War II, 
she's making overtures uh, with Israel. She, she just, it was a, I just read an email that she's ready to represent uh, Israel diplomatically everywhere. So now in reverse, I'm asking you, is this Ger the new Germany, do you think, or it's only at the surface what Angela Merkel and her, her uh, leadership are trying to, to, to project a, a different type of Germany? What do you think? I, I have too many thoughts on that to share in the limited time we have, and given that this is uh, connected to the actual topic in the fact that I am very ambivalent about <laughs> um, most Germans' attitude toward Israel and um, Judaism and, um, yeah, any, any effort to, to put my opinion in a nutshell would do a disservice to the topic and to you, so I'm not going to try that. I'd be happy to, to share some of my ambivalence with you bilaterally, but I think this is... Um, not maybe, not maybe a topic for another extemporary lecture at this point, but thank you for the question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.